Um, hi, folks. So this uh, is extending the life of layer three switches in a 256,000 and more route world. Uh, as a throwback to, uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, crashed the Herbalife party last night that was downstairs from the brewery, the uh, Lose Weight Now Ask Me How. Well, this is Lose Routes Now Ask Me How. Um, and, uh, and you're welcome to ask me. And uh, as, uh, as Bill said, I do work for a consultancy firm, so I can answer a question. And I'll even like to take money from you answering your question if you want to give it to me. Um, so uh, this is, this is, we've talked about this many, many times. It's a very common thing. I just want to give you some real world experience. Um, uh, some feedback on stuff that uh, we've actually deployed and, uh, and how it's performed. So problem really simple, a uh, few layer three switches. I'm not dogging on Cisco, just what we have most ex the experience with. So I'm just mentioning a couple very common Cisco platforms, SOUP2 MSFC2, 256,000 routes, SOUP723B, either 192 by default or 239 if you, uh, if you repartition the TCAM uh, and of course do a reboot. Uh, public internet routing table now is 260, uh, 263,000 routes, approximately, probably greater than. Let's not fight on that. Uh, and of course, that just doesn't work at all. I don't know how many of you have actually experienced what happens to some devices uh, when their forwarding tables get overrun, but it, it usually isn't uh, a good result, and it's not something that you want to uh, show up on your annual review. So uh, I'm targeting here enterprise data center network operators um, who have older equipment in there. Um, I'm not talking to you if you're providing BGP to your customers. You really want at that point in time, you want to be able to hold the full table and share the full table with your, uh, with your customer base. Um, this is uh, for enterprise data center networks that maybe are multi-homed uh, to multiple ISPs, and you're taking a full BGP feed um, either because you want it for better traffic engineering, so you want to send this AS here and that AS there, or you're uh, collecting data such as S-Flow, NetFlow, and you want to gather metrics, how much data going to this AS, this transit AS, this penultimate AS, uh, and so you really want that full table in there as much as possible. Uh, but you find yourself constrained by either funds, uh, power, rack space, just time, human resources, network engineers to go out and uh, make your devices uh, happy uh, for 263, 300, 320, more than 320,000 uh, routes in the free forwarding table. Um, ideal solution, uh, my opinion, I think some other people are of this opinion, um, why do we need so many routes in the forwarding table, especially, again, not an ISP's network, this is the enterprise, uh, multi-home, this is the data center multi-home. Um, uh, there's, there's not met that many uh, uh, next hops, so why do I need the whole table? Why can't my router software simply do some aggregation, say, well, you know, this aggregatable chunk of address space is all going out this one ISP link, uh, that's one forwarding table in your, in your TCAM. Um, uh, you know, maybe the vendors don't want to do the software because they want to sell the hardware and it's quicker. That's one conspiracy theory. There are lots of other reasons why, but the point is it doesn't work right now that way. Unless if it does, somebody tell me, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll start pitching that gear. Um, the current solution is you buy new hardware. Sometimes you just, really simple, you pull out the old management module, you put on the new management module if you're doing centralized forwarding. Um, sometimes you've got to upgrade every single line card in your chassis if you're doing distributed forwarding. Uh, sometimes, and this is, again, real world that we've run into, yeah, you can replace the, man the manager module, but all those manager modules fit in different slots in the chassis. Oh, and you need higher speed fan cards. Oh, and you have to go to 208 volt because you need more wattage and you've got to swap out your power supplies too. And, you know, that fan card is actually blocked by a whole bunch of Ethernet cables and you can't just swap it out without unplugging half your cables. Um, so you, we run into these problems. Uh, is there an acceptable workaround? Something to buy you time. This is not a permanent fix, but can we buy you some time? Um, it's got to be quick. It's got to be easy. It's got to be inexpensive. You need to re retain as much relevant routing information uh, in your table as possible, because again, you want it for traffic engineering statistics. And you need to maintain what I call routing accuracy. Uh, so the short answer, you've got to abbreviate the routing table, prune your BGP routes. Um, what's routing accuracy? What I define as routing accuracy is how much traffic we can still forward without following the default route. Um, anything that can't follow a shorter match and it goes out the default, uh, that's considered inaccurate. Uh, it's not the end of the world for you. It's not going to harm your end users because it's going to go to your upstream ISPs and your upstream ISPs, of course, can carry the full table. Uh, and they'll know, they'll know how to deliver that traffic. Um, so how is it done? If you want to do this, uh, the very first thing you must do is make sure all of your ISPs, in addition to the full table, are setting you default because there will be some traffic that you will no longer have in your forwarding table and you don't want to disrupt those people. Uh, make sure it's not just one ISP, please. All of your ISPs send you default so that when that one ISP goes down, you don't wonder how come you're getting additional calls from end users saying, oh, I can't, uh, this cable modem provider can't get to your, uh, get to your server. 
Um, and then you just throw away some of the long prefixes and you check your results. You check how much did I reduce my rounding table by, am I, am I happy with it, and uh, how accurate is my network. Uh, how much of your network can actually uh, uh, follow your uh, forwarding table without going to quad zero. Uh, if you want some ideas on how to do this, uh, ask me how and I'll give you some pointers. Um, so um, we, had a, we had a goal to try to uh, achieve uh, over 90% routing accuracy, uh, my personal goal was 99% routing accuracy and still allow the networks to run efficiently with their legacy hardware. Um, so this is the filter I did, pretty simple, um, 91 slash 8 just because uh, 91 slash 8 is kind of a, a curious uh, block that um, was allocated according to documentation was allocated up to slash 29. Uh, me personally, I'm happy rounding slash 24s on the public internet. Um, so for that, that block I did allow up to slash 24. For the classful A and B legacy space, so from first octet from uh, zero all the way to 191, uh, I'm going to allow up to and including slash 23s. So I'm just throwing away some slash 24s there. Uh, for everything else, the historical class C swamp space, uh, I'm just going to allow up to slash 24. Um, and uh, see what happened. So uh, when this was done, um, first time we did this uh, was in May of June of 2008. Not the first time, that's when we actually did this. We had a couple networks which were at 252, 253,000 routes saying, whoa, we're going to fall over any day. Um, so we managed to reduce them from 253 to 199,000, which fit very, very nicely, gave them some breathing room. Um, looking, uh, looking past into September, those same networks are now sitting at 205,000 routes. Again, pretty healthy. Um, and uh, by them, uh, you know, I don't know if they're going to have a month, two months, seven months, maybe ten months before they need to really make sure they get those, uh, those new devices in there. As far as accuracy, uh, in these cases on three different networks, we're able to uh, uh, maintain better than 99% accuracy. So it means that on a network running 1.5 gigabit per second at peak time, um, their uh, default route uh, was only uh, transiting 9 megabit per second of their network, 300 meg peak, 450 kilobit. And uh, the largest network I did this on was a 5 gigabit per second network uh, at peak time. Uh, less than 30 megabit per second actually followed uh, the default route, meaning um, those 54,000 routes we threw away were not very relevant to that network. Um, a few tips. Uh, what we tried to do here is uh, a apply a few broad strokes and then just get back to other work. Uh, first of all, we bill by the hour, and you know we didn't want to. Uh, the client really didn't want to spend uh, 100 hours uh, having us uh, fine tune the table. But at the same time, uh, if I can do a few broad stroke changes and uh, fix the problems, I can go on and do something more interesting. Because uh, we know that at, uh, at the end of it all, they're going to have to buy some more hardware eventually, or they're going to have to spend the time and actually implement it. Uh, don't dwell on minimum allocations. There were a couple examples um, in the nanog threads and the archives. Uh, a few very very smart people giving very good advice. Um, where they're building pretty complex uh, uh, prefix uh, filter sets based on minimal allocations. Um, it just seemed like a lot of work. Uh, it seemed like you were th maybe throwing a little too much that was relevant away, uh, maybe keeping a little too much just isn't that necessary. Uh, basically finding diminishing margin returns. So you can spend days and days and days uh, tweaking the route table. Uh, what will happen is you're going to reduce your forwarding table size, that's true. Um, you're definitely going to significantly reduce your accuracy. Uh, as well, and if that was a goal of yours, you know why? Why do it? So, anyway, broad strokes. Go make a VLAN change or ACL change or a 10 nanog or something. Um, wow! And there's a question slot. I actually pulled out another slide. Uh, just so you know, uh, after this, these are getting posted, right? So I'm not going to show you now, but uh, uh, when, if you download the presentation, I threw a couple references. The actual configuration, I actually gave it to you, um, uh, and uh, a couple uh, additional results. Uh, showing diminishing margin and if you're really curious where the minimum allocations are. So uh, you can download the PDF and uh, view them there. All right. Time for uh, one or two questions. <laughs> Anybody have anything? You all like it. That's good. Is that Rob oh, heading for the mic? Hi, Rob Seastrom. Uh, can you flip back to the slide that has the characterization of the packets that uh, were filed in all times on this? Uh, the accuracy one, this one? Yeah. Okay. So, I, I, I'm sort of not following the, uh, the, the last one there, but the, for the smaller flows, did you do anything in terms of analyzing those and trying to figure out whether they were traffic you actually cared about or whether it was uh, backscatter from that stuff that was floating in through the transit? Um, yes, so um, uh, I actually did um, uh, through some, uh, th this actually through some packet sniffer. Um, uh, following the default path, uh, take a look at what it was, and it was uh, it was real end user traffic, um, and uh, then I just 
I just took a sample, I mean, a mental sample, um, uh, sorry, a visual human sample of some of the destination IPs and looked back in the routing table and said, sure enough, um, these are, for the most part, they were broadband providers that were doing um, slash 24s and not announcing an aggregate, uh, a DAG as well. Sorry, not announcing the aggregate as well, they're just announcing a whole splattering of slash 24s. Uh, but it, it, it was all valid end user traffic. Yeah. All right, well, that's it for the questions. Thank you very much, Danny. Okay. And, uh, Thank you very much. And, uh,